Hi, my name is Rob Weiss. I'm an author, a sexologist, a sex addiction specialist, and I'm a recovering sex addict. Um, if you're a spouse or you're a partner, I am so glad you're here. We, we need the adults in the room when it comes to addicts. And unfortunately, or fortunately for you, you're the adult in the room uh, living with a person who's got an awful lot of challenges. And, so, and, and those challenges have, have affected you really deeply and really profoundly. For that, I am sorry for you. Um, I know that nobody intends to be in a relationship with someone who has these kinds of challenges. I know that no one walks, no one believe, no one wants to be hurt the way you're hurting. And all I can say to you is I'm aware of what you're going through. I've certainly worked with lots and lots of partners in pain. And, um, I think we have answers for you and that's what this video is for. We wanted to, uh, put a little bit of time into giving you some preliminary information uh, and to do that, I brought my uh, work colleague and friend, Tammy Verhelst, online. Hey, Tammy. Hey, Rob. Thanks for inviting me to participate. You are welcome. It's a lot easier for me to answer questions when someone's asking them. And so I asked Tammy, who, by the way, at Sex and Relationship Healing, Tammy will also often end up taking your calls, answering your emails. She's often the person who ends up uh, engaged in the relationship building that we do. And so um, she actually gets a lot of your questions. Um, and so I asked her to put a little compilation together of what were sort of typical questions that we hear from spouses of sex, love, and porn addicts, um, and uh, maybe be able to prepare you a little bit for what it is that we do here. So Tammy, do you have some questions? And let's roll and see if we can be helpful. I do. I want to start off with just letting honoring the, the partners, wives, spouses for being here. For those of you who are married, I know when you said I do, you didn't think this was going to happen. So um, that you're here and that we can hopefully help you find hope and healing. Um, this is just the first step. So I often get the question, what is sex addiction? So um, how, how do I know if my partner is a sex addict? Can you speak to that, please? Yeah, I, I can. Um, first of all, I would say that you already know this if you're a partner, because I know enough about partners to know that partners do research. And so you probably know that I'm an author and you can find some of my books on sex addiction, like Sex Addiction 101 or the workbook. Um, you can find uh, uh, a lot of books for partners and partner support here on the website. And if you go up to the resource bar up there, you will see uh, a whole list of books for partners. There's nothing better you can do than get educated to start because the more you know, the better. And I think partners really feel well armed when they have good education. Um, so th that's one thing you can do. Um, there are also sites online um, for support groups, for information, for partners of sex acts. There's a lot of places where you, uh, YouTube, some people have done videos, TED Talks. There's a lot of places where you can get information. And I just say the more informed you are, the better. Um, as far as what sex addiction is, um, very simply, it is a, an emotional disorder that leaves the person who has it seeking sex and sexual intensity and sexual fantasy and sexual imagery um, and the pursuit of sex in order to make themselves feel okay in the most basic way just like an alcoholic would have a drink or a gambler would sit down at that blackjack table, the sex addict is online looking at porn, running around looking at sex workers or trying to hook up with an affair partner because they are broken inside. And that brokenness in the way that they are broken leaves them, sex addicts, really not able to make use of the kind of intimacies and supports that the rest of us do. So you know, if I have a bad day and I'm not an addict, I, I'm probably going to call a friend or my wife or, or or husband or whatever it is and say, I had a bad day and this is what's going on with me. And maybe I go for a run. Maybe I kick the dog. Maybe I take a hot bath. You know, don't kick the dog, by the way. Um, but I don't go out and see prostitutes. I don't go to a casino. I don't pick up a bottle of whiskey because I had a bad day. And that's what addicts do. They turn to substances and behaviors to help them tolerate emotions or states of being that they feel are overwhelming to them. And unfortunately, one of the main reasons they have this problem is most of us didn't really have the most stable, supportive, nurturing upbringings. And those of you who've dealt with your mothers-in-law and some of the spouses who've dealt with some partners, parents, no offense to parents, love parents, you did the best you could, but those of us who are in these rooms, had some challenges in our upbringing and we didn't necessarily learn some of the lessons that other people need to learn. And I think it's important for you spouses to know that we're not about parent bashing. It's not my job to say, well, the, your spouse is broken because their parents had did this and if they just done that, 
I mean, that's interesting, but that isn't the issue. The issue is that they need today to learn how to live their life in a way that um, leaves them leaning into intimacy and friendship and support and away from casual, anonymous, um, isolated, sexual ways of making themselves feel better. Um, I, I want to say something, Tammy, I know I'm going on a little bit, but I want to say something for the partners about, um, you know, uh, is there anything that you can do to make this happen or cause this or drive the problem? And I really, really want every partner to hear this. I cannot say this more clearly. There is nothing that you can do to make someone that you love go have sex with another person or go look at porn. Um, you can make them angry. You can let them down. You can upset them. You can get angry at them, you know, you can do whatever you do and then they'll do whatever they do. That's sort of how life works. But there's a lot of things I can do when I'm having a bad day other than cheat on you. There's a lot of things I can do when you and I are having an argument other than pick up some porn. So if you think about it that way, um, does the person have a problem? Yes, they turn to cope and soothe and kind of regulate themselves by looking, turning to sexual intensity. Does that mean that it's your job to keep them calm and out of crisis and not with any arguments or disagreements so that they won't get disrupted and go act out? No, that's their job. Their job, the addict's job, is to come into an awareness of how much support they need, how much they need boundaries and structure, and how they can go out beginning to live their life in a way that doesn't lead them to acting out sexually when they're having a hard time. I think that the greatest challenges for a partner of a sex addict, or at least one of them, is that this isn't just an affair. And Lord knows, you know, I kind of wish it were for you. <laughs> you know, when someone's had an affair or they've just, just gone to Vegas and had a lap dance or something like that, you know, you can hate him for a while, you can get mad at him, you can, but ultimately they will hopefully, if they love you, realize that was a mistake. And I'm not going to do that again because I can see how much it hurt you. And you may think, oh, well, that person was really an asshole, but hopefully they're doing better and being nicer. You know, and that's the end of it. You work through it. And yes, trust is broken, but, but there are ways to weave trust and healing back in when there's been an incident or another incident. And by the way, it's much easier for the partner of someone who's cheated to really hate that person for a while. <laughs> But when you're married to or involved with a sex addict, it becomes confusing because our marriages, our commitments, our relationships tell us that we're supposed to try to help our loved ones when they're struggling. And you know, I hope, that if your spouse had cancer or they had some virus, you know, you'd be there and you'd help them and everyone around you would say, oh, that's so nice you're helping your spouse. But what do you do when they're a sex addict? I mean, you feel bad for them, but then you're angry at them. And then their problem is one that's hurting you. So how do you end up having compassion and empathy for them in their problem when what they're doing is directly wounding to you? And my answer to you is, it's just not your job to fix their recovery. You know, your job is to be angry at them. Your job is to be hurt. Your job is to express what you feel in an, in a, uh, without being violent, <laughs> without being physically abusive, uh, without being verbally abusive. Your job is to figure out what's been going on in the relationship and is this really the relationship I want to stay in? That's your job. Addicts, sex addicts need support, they need nurturing, they need boundaries, they need confrontation, they need containment, they need understanding. And you know what? That's what we're for. That's what this site is for. That's what these organizations are for. That's what these lectures, these interactions, that's what therapy's for. There are so many people who can support your partner into their healing, not your job. You can only support them best by helping them understand how their behavior has affected you and what they need to change if you are going to choose to stay with them. And then they get, I mean, they did this. And I don't like the word victim, but I will say that I believe that every partner of a sex addict over time is victimized. Because as Tammy was saying, you didn't intend to marry someone who's going to cheat on you and hurt you and let you down. And you were victimized in a situation where you expected it to be this way and it ended up being that way. And so that for you produces violation, pain, struggle, trauma, all of that. And you have, you have to deal with all of that. And that was dumped in your lap by the person who's been acting out. So you have plenty of your own stuff, sadly, that you're going to have to sort through your anger, your hurt, your disappointment, and I think that's where your focus gets to be, especially if your addicted partner or family member is here participating and getting help. Because then you at least can say, okay, 
I can relax a little bit because I see that they're in an active process of healing and, and I don't have to be the one to drive that. They have to, and you may kick them into healing by saying, you know, if you don't get well, I'm not going to do this with you anymore, relationship and all that. But ultimately, they have to take on that mantle of responsibility for their own healing as you do for yourself. A few things I want to point out that there's a self test a sexual addiction self-test on the sex and relationship healing.com website, which is really, yeah, yeah, up there, which is really useful. Um, uh, it, I, you know, I know that some partners go and take it with the behaviors that they know that their addict, so to speak, is um, exhibiting. But, but it, you know, if, if the addict is willing to take that assessment, they'll have a better understanding of what's going on. The other thing is, as I'm hearing you talk, you, and I use this a lot in the, um, information that I share with people because, you know, I think with sex addiction, it's, there's extra shame and there's extra levels, you know, and, and the betrayals, um, you know, not that alcoholism isn't devastating, but, but it's different. And um, one of the things that I share and I get a lot of response on is that sex addiction isn't about sex. It's, you know, we, you were sharing, it's, it's all the underlying things. And maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Sure. Um... So if you think about um, someone who's looking to run away from their feelings and find a place to go that they can escape into, um, they're going to need a drug to do it. And drug addicts, they have a lot, of, a lot of options. You know, they can pick heroin, they can pick marijuana, they can pick whatever. Gamblers have a lot of options. They can go play blackjack, they can go to the casino, they can go to the stock market. So, you know, what options does a sex addict have um, their option is to choose to fantasize about and disappear into the excitement and the pursuit of sex. And what I know about sex addicts, and this is true almost universally, they'll spend a week looking for sex and five minutes having it. And what, I, what that says to me, um, and this is what I'm trying to pass along to you guys, I think in Tammy's question is, for the addict, it's much. They're, the, what they're doing this for is not because they're dying to have sex with other people or because you're not enough for them or because they're, they need something different than you or what they, that's not what they're doing. They're, they're pursuing the idea of sex. They're pursuing the, the fantasy of sex. The actual sex they have when they have it is usually not even that interesting, but they may spend three weeks looking for it. And it's in the looking it's in getting someone's card. It's in someone saying, oh, I'd love to hook up with you. It's in looking on the app and finding someone who's clicked your box and wants to meet you. It's all those little moments of, I am wanted. I am desired. I am important. All of, all of that produces a lot of adrenaline, a lot of endorphins, a lot of neurochemistry gets stirred up with that kind of fantasy. And the main chemical that really gets uh, stirred up for sex addicts is adrenaline. They get really, really excited and really, really into what they're going to go do. And here's the thing. When you are pumping out adrenaline, your heart beats faster, your pupils dilate, you start to sweat a little bit, um, you might feel a flush or a little bit of sense of heat. This is all related to the release of adrenaline. You would go through this if we had an earthquake or a tornado or a hurricane or we went to war. You know, you would probably just be thinking about, am I going to be okay? Are my kids going to be okay? Everything else would kind of go out of your head. That's what happens when we're in a crisis. In other words, when adrenaline starts hitting us, everything goes out of our head except that immediate thing in front of us. That's fight or flight. That's survival. You know, um, the, the, uh, when you see a kid who's walking across the street and there's a truck coming, if you had to take the time to think in, your, in our big brains, well, if I cross the street at this angle and they go at this speed, then maybe I'll be able to intercept the tr truck. You know, we don't think like that. We just run and get the kid because in that moment, our heart is pounding, our pupils are dilated. We're in a state of intense um, uh, 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 arousal, emotional arousal. And in those moments, you know, what happened at work today? What's going on with my spouse? What's going on with my kids? All of that literally goes out of our heads. And so if you think about the goal of a sex addict being to get so emotionally excited about what they might go do and then pursue it to get even more excited, and I don't mean genitally excited, I mean endorphins, um, uh, 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 substances of mood like uh, uh, um, serotonin, dopamine, all, all of that, and most especially adrenaline. And when that person starts to use the sexual fantasy, they're using it to shift their brain chemistry, to literally be in a different place emotionally. And it works really, really well while it works, except once the sex is over, then they're back where they started. So 
I, I think what Tammy is hinting at, I want to want to get to you, is that, that addiction is a neurochemical process where whether it's a behavioral addiction or a substance addiction, where that person uses not only the experience itself, but the whole lead up to the experience, the whole process of searching and looking and hunting and all that, they use that as a means of emotional escape. And as long as I am looking at porn or pursuing the prostitute or thinking about the affair, I'm not able to, nor do I have to worry about anything else that's going on in my life. Now, once the sexual act is over and once I've done it, then all that's going to come flooding back and I'm probably going to be more disturbed inside than I was before. And that's where we start to talk about the cycle of addiction because when, uh, if we believe that addicts are acting out because they don't know how to handle emotional disruption or emotional challenges or emotional, you know, strong emotional states because they didn't grow up learning how to deal with those things, well, what happens when you're acting out sexually makes you feel bad. What happens when you have a fight with your spouse and they find out and you feel bad? You know, what happens when your boss finds the porn on the computer and says, if you do this one more time, all of that for the addict is shameful, um, humiliating, infuriating, um, frustrating. And guess what we do with those feelings? We go act out over them. So there's a cycle that begins to happen where the more upset I get about the way my life is going, especially if I can't quite piece it together with the sex and all that, but things just seem to be getting worse the more I turn to the sex and the pursuit of sex and the porn and all that, but then the worse I feel about that because that comes with secrecy and hiding and lying and all and living a double life. The, the deeper I get into that double life, the worse I feel about myself, the worse I feel about myself, the more I go act out. Um, and without interruption, without, this is the word intervention, right? Without intervention, um, that person is going to continue to do what they've been doing, whether you're in their life or you're not. So what does sexual sobriety mean and how will, if my partner gets into sexual sobriety, how will that affect our relationship? It will affect your relationship. Um, sexual sobriety is, uh, first of all, it's not the same as alcohol and drug sobriety, for example, because alcohol and drug sobriety is something called abstinence, meaning you don't use no mood altering substances. That's it. Um, you know, aspirin about as far as you go. And so, um, in sex addiction, or when we're dealing with naturally occurring functions like food or sex, where people have an addictive relationship with them, we don't say to the food addict, well, guess what? You're going to really do well because you're never going to eat again. You know, we, you know, we're going to make you abstinent from food. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense because then the person wouldn't live very long. And besides, abstaining from a naturally occurring function like eating is not healing. It's just avoidance. And so in the same way, what sex addicts need to do is they need to define what is healthy sexuality for them based on their life, their situation. And, and, and think about it, you know, the person who is 35 years old and married and has two kids, how he defines his sexual health is probably going to be very different than the 22 year old who's single and never been on a date is going to define their sexual sobriety. So um, sexual sobriety are the boundaries in which the person that you're involved with can be healthfully sexual and, and not. Um, this is something that sex acts do in environments like this. When we work with you and when we work with your partners, we provide educational materials. We help them create contracts and plans for sexual sobriety. The 12 step programs help provide contracts and plans for sexual sobriety. Sex addiction therapists can help supply that and help provide that. They're written contracts. They're signed. They're agreed to. The person who is your spouse is accountable to that contract and that's how they gauge their sobriety. So, you know, I'll just make it up. You know, I, I might have a plan for sobriety that says no porn, no sex outside of a relationship, no calling old boyfriends or girlfriends, no looking at um, magazine, you know, videos or, you know, all of that. And, um, but it might include healthy sex with my partner. It might include masturbation without porn. Uh, you know, I don't know because it depends on the person, but we're going to define and create a plan that works for them to stop having the incredibly damaging consequences that they're having to stop hurting you is part of the plan. And um, by the way, if you are working with, if your husband or wife or your spouse is involved with some kind of recovery, um, you have a right to see that plan. Um, I've worked with sex addicts who say, oh, well, that's my, that's my sex plan. I'm not going to show that to my spouse. Why not? I think you absolutely have, a, you know, you don't have a right as a spouse just to say it to know what someone else in a recovery meeting said or what someone else in a group therapy said or what other people say is confidential. 
but there's nothing confidential or shouldn't be for you in terms of what your husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend is doing toward healing. They get, you get to see any and all of that. You should be able to go to their therapist with them if you want. You should be able to look at their plans and their work. And eventually you should be able to have some kind of disclosure if you are planning to stay in the relationship, um, which is a part of the therapeutic process that we do here and we do uh, in various places in the work. I think speak briefly since you mentioned it about disclosure. Um, so I've been in the field for about 25 years, the field of sex addiction treatment. And what I have seen is spouses increasingly, I believe be better understood and get better care. And one of the things that we strongly believe in the field of sex addiction is that if you are committed to a long-term relationship, if you, the spouse, despite your hurt and anger, want to stay, um, then we believe that you have the right to know what you don't know. Um, now, the sex addict who's listening to this, he or she is not going to like this. This may get them off the site right away, and that's okay because I believe that good work is not just about healing the person or the problem. It's also about healing your coupleship, and healing your coupleship involves your restoring intimacy in the relationship, and intimacy means being known fully. So if your man or your woman has secrets from you, if there's stuff you don't know about, how can you be truly intimate? And how can you feel safe about whether they've returned to their sexual behavior or they seem to be back in it, or if you don't even know half of what they've done? I, I also happen to think that, uh, I also believe that disclosure is important because spouses sometimes will say, okay, so he went, through, he, went through, he went through a few strip clubs, he looked at some porn, you know, he's got a little bit of a problem, but, you know, that's his problem, you know, we'll work it out. I have seen that. And believe me, addicts work really hard to say it's not a big deal, don't worry about, you know, because we don't want you angry at us and we don't want you making a big deal out of us, out of this. And I've also seen disclosures done with those partners when they say, oh, wow, wow, this is a lot bigger. You weren't just going to massage parlors three times, you were going three times a week. You know, you weren't just having one affair, you had seven. That kind of detail is really helpful for part, not, not, the, not graphic sexual details that will make you uncomfortable, but just a general sense of what has happened while you've been in this relationship, I think can really help guide your healing and help the two of you move toward uh, being a couple that doesn't have secrets, that doesn't have anything keeping them apart. And, and, and I have to say for the addict, it also means less shame because when I look at you, I know that you know everything about me, even the, the ways that I've hurt and harmed and disappointed you. And, and I know that you're still here. And as crazy as that seems to me, maybe I'm worth something more than my acting out because you, just, you chose to stay with me. Um, that's a really profound moment for a lot of addicts that they never get if they don't tell their truth. Um, so that's a little bit about disclosure. It's not something I would recommend, by the way, doing without a therapist or a professional. And, and let me just say this also, a partners, I know that you want to know everything and you want to know it yesterday. I don't want you to know everything and know it yesterday if you don't have the support that you need to hear it. If you don't have a therapist, if you're not in a support group, you know, you're going to be devastated. This is hard stuff. And I don't want you, you know, without a ride home from the therapy session or the disclosure session, I don't want you without a plan for the weekend. If you decide, you guys decide you don't want to spend the weekend in the same house, all of those kinds of things need to be planned out and thought about. So you're not just dumped with a bunch of information that is overwhelming to you and you don't know what to do with. Um, so yes, you have every right, I believe, to know what's happened, mm -hmm. but in a structured and guided way where you will get that information and remain safe, and so will the addict. Thank you for clarifying that. So it's been decided that my partner has an issue with sex addiction. How do I get that person into recovery? Hmm. Well, I don't know that you can get someone else into recovery. I don't know that anyone can really do that because the motivation for recovery has to come from within. Um, I think you can decide what are you willing to live with and not live with. Um, you can begin to get support for yourself and talk about the problem and believe, and let me say this to you ladies who have maybe have a more abusive man around if he's cheating, who says, I don't want you to tell anybody about this. Forget it. You can tell anyone you want. I mean, if you, you, do, you have been victimized by this. You didn't expect this man to cheat on you or this woman to cheat on you. And if you need help or support from someone, go find that help and support and don't protect him or her from the consequences. I will say, however, and I, I think this is important, think carefully when you do reach out to people because you know, you're in a lot of pain, you're confused, you want support, completely understand that. 
I, I hope that as we go along, this will be a place where you can find that maybe with other spouses as we meet in some groups and you get to know each other. But do think about that desire when you want to go tell your kids what their dad did, or you want to go tell your sister what your husband did or your wife did, because once somebody knows this, they, they don't forget it. And you don't want to tell your children something in anger and have them never look at their mother or father in the same way. You may not want to tell your mother something or your father something. And then when Thanksgiving comes, they're looking at him or her like, Oh yeah, you did that to my kid." So, so I, I absolutely believe, believe that you need support. I just think it's very important to make sure that the support you're getting is not coming out of your anger. Like I'm screw her. I'm going to tell everybody their life and really, you know, but more out of who will be there for me who can understand and love me. And, and let me say something about that too. Um, I have heard a lot of partners who've been cheated on who get this message. I don't understand how you can stay with him. Why don't you get out of there? Why are you in that relationship? How could you let someone do that to you and all of that crap? And, you know, I say it's crap because, you know, your next door neighbor, your friend, your sister, whoever is saying those things to you, they're not having to look up giving up their home, their life, their partner. You know, it's very easy to sit back and say to you, oh, well, you shouldn't, you know, stay with that, or you shouldn't put up with that. I, I don't think that that's as easy in practice to live if you are the person it's happening to. Most partners I've worked with, in the beginning especially, they, they're more thinking like, what was the license plate on that truck that just hit me? You know, they're in a crisis, you're in a crisis. You're not really, usually, in my experience, ready to decide whether I want to be with this person or not, or should I move, or you're just trying to figure out what's happening to my family, and what's true and what isn't true, and how do I find the foundation of what we have or had so that I can figure out if this is buildable or not, and, and that's really the goal for us with you, is to help you figure out, you know, really what's happened, um, where you stand, where this other person stands, and how you can responsibly go forward for your own healing, for the healing of your family, and for those you love. Okay, so I hear that I can't get my partner into recovery. What's my role in their recovery then? Um, as unfortunate as it is for me to bring this to you, I think your role is to take care of yourself. And what I mean is, if your partner is out having anonymous sex or sex with prostitutes or sex online, you know, and they're lying to you about it, you're not safe. Um, I don't know if that person's having oral sex safe or anal sex safe, or I don't know what they're doing. So I worry about with partners, I worry about STDs and I worry about your physical health. I worry about your emotional health. Every time you say, didn't you say you're going to be home at six? And, and, and they say, Oh no, no, no. I said seven. And you think I could swear they said six. And, and the truth is they, that they did say six, but now they want it to be seven. And now they got you doubting yourself. So I worry about partners being gaslighted like that. That's the term for that. Um, I worry about partners being told that it's their fault. Um, and I worry about partners um, who think that they can handle this, that with enough love or enough sex, or if I lose 20 pounds, or that somehow he or she will then be, or if I just have sex with them all the time. You know, I think one of the uh, it's a it's an obvious challenge, I think, for anybody in a relationship to think that you really don't have control over their behavior. Um, but the truth is, is that, you know, you have to take care of yourself if you think your partner is acting out sexually and it is really uh, potentially destructive to you or others, you may or may not be able to stay with that person. You may or may not want to keep them in your bed. You may want to send them to another room. You may want to start therapy yourself and figure out, you know, you may want to join with some of the other spouses here and figure out what they're doing. I, I think that your job is to take care of yourself and your loved ones with the hope that if you, if you want to, you can continue to love this person as they heal, if they're willing to heal. Um, personally, I, I don't know that I would want to stay with an active addict if they were unwilling to heal because um, I, I don't know that I could live with the, I don't know when you're going to come home, if you're going to come home, who's going to call in the middle of the night, what my neighbors are going to see, or, you know, there's a, all of that is not their problem. It's going to be your problem. And so, you know, again, the first thing I recommend you do is get support for yourself because there's not a lot you can do when you're feeling very, very vulnerable and very, very hurt and very, very scared to fix anybody but yourself. 
Um, you need to be in a stronger place to be able to put up boundaries, to set limits, to get into therapy or into a group situation with him and say, or her and say, this is what I'm willing to put up with and this is what I'm not. Um, most of all, I, I discourage you from doing this alone. Um, there are certified sex addiction therapists. There are sex addiction therapists and professionals all over the country. You can find us online. You can find most of us through this site if you just go up there and look for find a therapist. And I think that being guided by a professional may just uh, help you help the addict. So I know you've got your new book, Prodependence, Moving Beyond Codependency. And I hear some of what you were talking about in that um, a little bit in that book. Can you elaborate a little bit on why you wrote that book and what the, where that play, uh, where that comes from with you? Well, thanks, Tammy, for bringing that up. I, I, I admire anyone who brings up a book I've just written. Um, this is my ninth, by the way. So if you think, you know, oh, the guy's running the site's a crazy person, I am a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a bit crazy for wanting you to understand the world as I see it and in, in the work that I've done. And so after 25 years of um, watching people respond to the word codependency in a negative way, I decided that it just wasn't working. And the truth is, is that we don't have a, there's never been a diagnosis of codependency. It's never been in our formal diagnostic journals. There's no formal treatment for codependence or codependency. It really is a more of a pop label that was very popular. It was an idea, a concept for partners of addicts that was seen to have a lot of merit in the eighties and nineties. And, um, but in function, we don't see it being that helpful. Uh, and so I'll, I'll explain that briefly. Codependency basically says that, there, that you as a spouse have something wrong with you, that you've always had something wrong with you, having to do with your upbringing and your emotional challenges growing up. And that's why you chose this addict. You unconsciously chose a troubled person. You were uh, going to choose a troubled person no matter what. And then you were bound to uh, join with them in their addiction and make it worse for them and for you. And then codependency says, now that you realize that, that you had, you've had a lifelong problem with relationships, that you're playing out that problem in this relationship, then let's figure out how to make you better as a partner uh, to help your part of the relationship heal. And my experience with most of you guys is you guys say, screw you. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with me. I'm the one who's been working two jobs and taking care of three kids. And but while he's or she's been out there doing all this crazy stuff, and I, ha I happen to agree with you. I think a lot of uh, when you partners look crazy is because you're living with a crazy person. And when you live with an addict who is lying to you and cheating on you and telling you that black is white and white is black, and you know it's very hard to keep your wits about you. And so what I see partners expressing when they first come into therapy or into a healing process when they're involved with an addict, I, I see partners having almost universally done everything they can to make their relationship heal. Like, I think that you have gone to the wall to try to make things better, or at least to figure out what's going on. If you don't understand why this person's distant, unavailable, you know, you have probably done an awful lot by this point to try to make this relationship better. I have seen many a partner who's dragged their sex addict to therapy. And of course the therapist, they just never told the therapist about all their sexual behavior. You know, I've seen many a partner who has done, turned themselves inside out trying to make this work and trying to fix the addiction. And, and to me, that's not pathology. That's loving your family. You know, I, I believe, and the reason I wrote Prodependence is simply this. You know, if you were married to someone who had cancer and you had to take three jobs and drop all your recreation activities and you gained 30 pounds because you were caretaking for your partner who had cancer, you know, your neighbors would love you. They would bring you food. Your, your, your friends would call you a saint. People would be there for you and they would never question your absolute giving to your family. And yet, you know, if you say that your partner is an alcoholic or an addict, they say, oh, well, don't do too much enabling and you got to watch out for that kind of pen. In other words, you get blamed for the loving acts that anyone would do to take care of uh, and, and rescue the family they love. And so my belief and the reason I wrote Prodependence is because I think that what you need when you come to our offices is us to wrap our arms around you and say, wow, you've done such a great job trying to love into a situation that is very difficult to love into. You've been trying very hard to love someone who's kind of broken. You've been trying really hard to figure out a situation that where you don't even have half the information and, you know, and, and we want to support you. 
We want to help you love this person better if that's what you want to do. We want to help you make the addiction go away if that's what you want to do. And we certainly don't blame you in any way for any efforts you've made to try to repair, fix, heal, or rescue your family because who wouldn't? I mean, that's, that's what life's about, friends. It's about us taking care of the people who take care of us. So um, I believe that partners walking in for help need to be embraced and validated for the hard work that they've done and then given really good answers for where to go next. So the final question is, you know, can someone, can a couple that has experienced sexual addiction and betrayal, can they ever be happy again? Um, you know, I, I, I've treated <clears throat> probably close to a thousand couples in the last uh, 25 years. And I would say that give or take about 80%, eight, zero percent stay together. And the reason I believe they stay together is because, um, and you probably know this better than me, you have a lot going, more going on than cheating. You know, maybe you have kids, maybe you have a home, maybe you're involved with church together, maybe you work together, maybe you have community or, you know, that you have a lot, you have a lifetime invested together or 10 years or five years or 50. And, and, and what I've experienced is that the cheating often isn't the thing that ends the relationship. Most relationships that I see end as a result of this issue being identified were couples that were probably not going to stay together anyway. They had some really profound cracks in the foundation of their relationship. And the sex addiction piece was the tipping point that just ended the relationship. Most couples I see and work with stay together because number one, they are both motivated for change. There is a deep love and affection and an enduring connection between them that, and maybe for their kids if they have them that goes beyond the immediate problem. And they do want the highest and best good for that other person, even if that person has let them down and hurt them. Um, in those couples, I see tremendous hope for change and healing. If you go from a coupleship where there's been secrets and compartmentalization and lying and manipulation, if if that coupleship goes to honesty and integrity and truth telling, that might be a pretty fabulous coupleship. I, I will say, and I think it's important to say, you know, that the the scar that betrayal leaves that doesn't heal. You know, um, I think it was Beyonce said uh, 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 that betrayal is like a plate. You know, you can break it and you can glue it back together, but it will never be the same. You know, your relationship will always show that crack. And so I do believe that the naive sense that this person, above all other people, they would never let me down, they would never hurt me, they would never disappoint me, that will not come back because now you know that this person, for whatever reasons, they have gone out there, they have done something that has hurt you, they, and they're very capable of doing it again. But that doesn't mean that there aren't deeper, more meaningful, more long-term intimacies that you can grow and maintain together. Um, I think people can become stronger as couples because of situations like this, but only if both members of the couple are invested in the long-term hard work that it takes to heal these things. And, and it's funny, Tammy, I, I don't say this a lot, but a, many of the couples I do see break up are the ones that have only been together for two or three years. They don't have kids yet, you know, and it's kind of like, okay, I get that this is what's going to be like for the long haul and I'm not in for this. <laughs> you know, it's easier when you don't have all those years built up, not easy by any means, but easier to say, this is going to be a long-term commitment to someone who's really struggling and I'm not in for that. And, and I, I respect that. But the couples have been together for a while, like it or not, often have so much deeply entwined emotional, physical, spiritual, and family that they're not really wanting to come apart. And and for them, if they're both willing to work, they can have a pretty amazing relationship um, over time. That's been my experience too. In fact, often it's a deeper, at, at a much deeper, more significant level than they ever experienced because they have different tools to apply to the relationship. Well, and not only that, Tammy, but they're talking about things that they never used to talk about. You know, couples need to talk about sex. Couples need to talk about their sex life. Couples need to talk about their feelings. Couples need to talk about secrecy and hiding and secrets. And when there's a lot of unknowns in a relationship, no one's really talking about a lot of things. It's quite interesting to me that, I, and I see this in partners a lot, and maybe I should stop here, that when you guys often find out about what's happened, it's the weirdest thing. Some of you will say, you know, I know now that he or she has been cheating on me and lying to me, blah, blah, blah. It's been going on for three years. And but somehow I feel closer to them. And th that seems counterintuitive, but the fact is, is that, well, at least 
Now you know what's been going on. Now you know where they've been. Now you know why they've been distant. Things begin to make sense. And when they start to make sense, which is really what partners want, they want to understand, um, then you can begin to dial into where we might go next. Um, so um, in any case, I just really want to say to you spouses, you have a rough ride and it's rough on a variety of levels. It's rough because you've been betrayed. It's rough because you've been lied to. It's rough because you don't know if you can trust this person now or in the future. It's rough because your hopes and dreams have been shattered and you don't know in what way they're going to get put back together. And it can be especially rough because the man or woman you're with, they may not be fully ready to embrace change despite seeing your pain, your suffering, and your challenge. And, and, and I mean, they may be saying, oh, I'm going to meetings, I'm working on this, but at the same time still lying to you still keeping secrets, and you can feel that, you know, you just feel that. Let me say that one last thing to you spouses, and then I'm going to go. Um, one of the most important things that we say to spouses is trust your gut, and I, I can't reinforce that strongly enough. I know that you have a reason to not trust, and that you're going to question everything now, every letter, every phone call, every and, and as you should, but there is a deep sense in within you, within every partner, I think, of whether there is a healing truth that lies ahead of us or, or isn't. And I can't answer that for you, but I think you know that. And you will know when this person is moving toward healing or if they're just kind of found a new way to look good and do what they've always been doing. You'll know that. And what's most important is that you trust that. Uh, I hope you keep coming back. I hope you join us for many of the other lessons and lectures and opportunities we're going to have here on sexandrelationshiphealing.com. And, and thanks, Tammy, for, for facilitating this meeting. Thanks, Rob.